Kid Mori seems to be just another average high schooler that lives in modern-day Korea, but in reality, he is an insanely strong guy, who is a skilled martial artist. He lives alone in a house, and the closest kin that he had was his grandfather, who went missing when he was young. My dad went to get milk and never came back, but no one is making a show about me. What a shame. Despite having a problematic childhood, he turned out to be a very good-natured and just individual who, despite having incredible strength, never abuses it. Jin Mori wakes up in his house and looks over to see that his alarm clock has been destroyed. He wonders whether he had anything important lined up for today and realizes in horror that he had to attend the preliminary round for the God of High School tournament today. He dresses up, grabs his bike, and pedals with all his might, riding very dangerously. God of High School is a famed martial arts tournament that is hyped up in the entire Seoul region of Korea, and everyone is tuning in to live stream the battles that are going to take place in the tournament. The organizers claim that anyone who wins the tournament will be able to wish anything they want from the organizers, and their wishes will be granted without any questions. I think these organizers are tripping or something, how the hell are they going to grant the winner anything? What if I ask for a gamer girlfriend with big thighs? Jin peels through the traffic, rushing towards the stadium, when he spots a biker going in the opposite direction, which he ignores at first, but then notices an old lady on the ground, screaming that the biker ran away with her purse. Jin immediately starts thinking about all the different situations the old lady might be stuck in, which brings him to tears. He immediately turns around and despite being late, starts chasing the biker. He chases after the bike for a very long duration, swerving in between the traffic, dodging the oncoming cars, and sometimes even pulling death-defying stunts when he faces an oncoming truck. Truck coming almost ice caved this fool, but thankfully he is able to escape. He finally is able to come right beside him when the biker starts trying to push him off the road, but this absolute mad lad jumps on the bike and starts biting him, which is kinky to say the least. He is forced off, jumps on his bike again, and jumps it over to the upper road, chasing the thief again. He suddenly spots a girl about his age, watching as a bunch of roided up men flex their muscles for her. He tries to warn her, but is unable to dodge and literally hits her straight in the face with his tire, before saying sorry and pedaling away. The girl, however, is not a normal girl and throws her wooden sword, which jams Jin's tire, bringing him down. She runs up to him, grabs him by his collar, and starts screaming at his battered face to pay for the glasses that he broke. Jin mumbles through his swollen lips, telling her that the thief is running away with an old woman's purse, which metals her heart, and suddenly they both start chasing the thief. What a weird woman. Jin keeps pedaling while the girl stands up behind and tries to swat away at the biker, like he is some sort of a fly. The booker decides to show them who is the boss, and takes a very sharp turn, expecting to lose them, but to his surprise they are still behind him, as the girl used her wooden sword to grip the road and make the tight turn. The biker decides to throw away a bunch of money to distract them, but Jin tells the girl to jump off and stops the bicycle suddenly. The girl leaps and tries to jump onto the thief, but gets face planted into a road sign. Both Jin and the girl think that they lose him, and even the thief runs away laughing when suddenly, a young man punches him straight in the face, destroying his bike, and finally taking him down. It turns out that all three of them needed to go to the God of High School tournament, and they all barely make it, and while catching their breath, Jin introduces himself to the others. The cool black-haired guy introduces himself as Han, who works at a local supermarket, and the crazy chick introduces herself as Mira, who is a kendo instructor at her father's dojo. Before they can chat anymore, a guy from the administration walks into the room and tells everyone to gather in the arena for their introduction, and everyone moves out. The commentator explains the rules of the fight, and the first and most important rule is that there are no goddamn rules. This guy literally tells us that the participants can use any weapon they want and any technique they want to try and win the tournament, and we see a bunch of people carrying sticks, staffs, and baseball bats. Lucky that this series didn't take place in America. There wouldn't have been any episodes after the first one. Anyway, everyone assembles in the area and is given a health monitoring bracelet, which records their current status. If anyone gets dangerously low on HP, they are given immediate medical attention by two very professional nurses with huge personalities. The commentator asks whether everyone is clear on the rules before declaring that the round starts now. Everyone is confused at this as they haven't been put into any kind of brackets or don't know who their opponents are thinking it must be a mistake, but some of them realize that it is a battle royale style match, where the last man standing wins. Some of the ugly fighters catch up to it and start targeting individuals who are weaker than them, so that they can defeat them easily. A massive, all-out brawl breaks out, where people are fighting left and right, some are using wooden staffs, some are using nunchucks, and others are relying purely on their fists. We see some fighters of note, one being a very woke guy dressed in a woman's dress, because gender is just a social construct and you can be whatever you want. 
Another girl with a huge personality starts using her wrestling moves, which she learned in bed to good use and starts beating people up, while the nerd simply grabs a baseball bat and starts piling up bodies left and right. Finally, Han shows his strength by using a single punch to defeat a huge horde of enemies like the cool dude he is, and Mira also uses her wooden sword to slice through the fighters, showing off how good she is at handling wood. Finally, Jin starts showing his skills by laying waste to a group of attackers by only using his kicks, absolutely dominating the entire competition. The fights are far from over, however, as the commentator declares that there is a last-minute wildcard entry to the match, and a couple of men bring out a giant man restrained by a straight jacket. This gorilla-looking freak doesn't even think twice before jumping straight into battle and kicking everyone away one by one. Even Han and Jin are surprised by Fatty's incredible speed. He stands on top of a fighter, kicking his face and taunting the others for being weak, when he is attacked by Mira, who uses her wood to try and hit him. I don't really remember his name, so I'll call him Harambe. Harambe dodges all of her attacks before grabbing her wood in between his toes. Mira is totally shocked by it, as he takes away her toy, which enrages her, and she uses her sword style to hit him in the stomach, knocking the air out of him before kicking him on the head, with all the power mustered by her big juicy chicken thighs, but they don't have any effect on Harambe, who simply pushes her back before laughing in her face. Suddenly, however, his laughter stops as Jin drops to his knees and takes his pants down to reveal his colorful boxers full of cartoons. Harambe turns around and asks whether he wants to blow his trumpet, but Jin backs out at the last moment and puts his pants back in place before getting attacked. He dodges the kicks very efficiently before being hit by one of them, which throws him against the wall, but Jin is so extraordinarily skilled that in the split second that he was being kicked, he elbowed his leg, hurting him for the first time in the match. Harambe seems excited at this prospect, but both him and Jin start running towards each other to finish the fight that they started. With Wei and Clash, however, Mira, the Thunder Thigh Lady, runs up behind Jin and snaps his neck because he was still carrying her sword and not giving it back to her, ending the fight immediately. With this, the first round is declared to be over and everyone starts getting healed, with the help of the Nanomachines injected inside their bodies. Later that evening, Jin walks back alongside Mira and Han and asks them how they got to know about this tournament. He claims that he was in a park when a man asked him to join the tournament, so he fought him and lost the match, and that's why he joined the tournament. Han replies that he was approached by a green-haired man who promised him money, which he desperately needs, whereas Mira replies that she wants to revive her family dojo. Jin, however, snatches her sword once again to have a look at it, but Mira tries to take it back, which results in the sword falling into the river below, which enrages Mira, who slaps Jin, telling him to leave her alone. She goes down inside of the stream and starts searching for her sword while using the little flashlight on her phone, but Jin comes to the rescue with the flashlight and starts helping her try to find it. She apologizes to him for slapping him before and reveals that the sword was a gift from her late father, and that is why it holds a lot of sentimental value for her. They keep searching, but the light still isn't enough, but thankfully, Han brings out a big spotlight and shines it over the stream to give them ample light to work with, and they finally find the sword. The next day, they head over to the stadium once again for the matches, and today the matches will be one-on-one -on -one as they should be. Jin sleeps inside of the locker room, when Harambe walks up to him and starts telling him that he is going to crush him. To his surprise, however, the dress-loving boy walks up to Harambe and starts telling him to leave Jin alone as he is sleeping, when Harambe immediately goes in for a kick. The boy is saved by Jin, at the very last moment by pulling him back, but still, the pressure in the air was enough to make his nose bleed. Before they could fight, however, the commentator announced that the matches were going to begin shortly. Mira goes in for her first match and easily dispatches the guy who came to fight him, after which Jin is called in the ring to fight against a fatty. He is obviously able to defeat him easily by using a combination of kicks and punches. The next match is between the wrestler with a big personality, a random dude, and the wrestler beats the attacker very easily with her amazing moves. After that, the nerd is called inside the ring, and he uses his bat to beat the crap out of the fatty who came to fight him while reading a book. What an alpha male. The next match is fought between Han and a guy who looks like he just got a divorce. Han is basically Satama at this point, as no matter who he is fighting against, he seems to defeat them in a single punch. Finally, the match between the femboy, who I am going to call Harry Styles because both of them like wearing dresses, and Harambe begins. What an incredible matchup. The fight starts and Harry goes on to deliver a massive blow to Harambe's stomach before landing a bunch of punches to his face, throwing him into the crowd. The referee starts counting to 20, but Harambe doesn't seem to be in any hurry. 
He calmly gets up and starts walking to the ring before jumping inside with surprising speed. Harry meets him in the air, kicking him, but Harambe takes one of his hands out of the restraints, blocking his attack. This time, Harambe goes on the offensive, defending against Harry's attacks, before starting to hit him with multiple strikes on the body and the head. He doesn't let him go and keeps following up with even more attacks, totally dominating him before grabbing his hair and delivering an axe kick to his head. He then grabs Harry by the throat and picks him up in the air, punching and kicking him multiple times before he gets the inspiration to finally fight back. He tries to use one of his special moves on Harambe, but Harambe is able to counter his move, which sends him flying into the corner of the ring. He then walks back up to him and starts slapping him again and again, telling him to beg for forgiveness, but Harry looks at him and tells him that he isn't going to beg him, no matter what. This enrages Harambe who grabs him by the throat once again, before throwing him on the ground and kicking the crap out of him. Harry, however, still refuses to beg which makes him so furious that he takes out his other hand from the restraint and picks him up before proceeding to break one of his hands completely. Harry cries out in pain but he ignores it and grabs his other arm as well, breaking it before threatening to rip them off completely, but is stopped by Jin, who appears behind him and kicks him straight in the head, throwing him towards the corner of the ring before telling him to get up and fight him. Harry is taken out of the ring, while Harambe jumps towards Jin, but Jin is able to kick him straight in the face one more time, throwing him outside of the ring. Before he could pursue him, however, Jin was surrounded by a bunch of people who told him to stop and the commentator told him that what he did was a violation of rules and he would be punished for it. Before he could say anything, however, Harambe emerged surrounded by a dark aura before he threw a blast of that aura at Jin. Thankfully, one of the organizers surrounding Jin is able to easily block the attack, but Harambe seems to have gone berserk and jumps inside the ring to fight against Jin once again. Even though he was surrounded by their very powerful organizers, Jin managed to jump on one of their shoulders and meet Harambe in the air before delivering an insane three-kick combo, throwing him to the ground. Jin lands back inside of the ring but suddenly, a mysterious force pushes him down on the ground. A man arrives inside of the stadium, introducing himself as Pat Mujin, the creator of this tournament. He announces that what Jin did was a gross violation of the rules and his punishment will be announced at a later time. Meanwhile, the matches will be played as scheduled. Jin is then escorted out of the ring by the organizers. Jin is taken to a separate room where he trains, while the organizers decide what's going to happen with him. He doesn't seem to be scared about anything, and he even goes over to watch Mira's match. She is going to fight against the wrestler today, and before even the fight starts, the wrestler makes fun of Mira, telling her to use something more powerful than a wooden sword. Mira, however, tells her to shut up before she pops one of her implants. The fight starts and Mira tries her very best to attack her from all the directions, but the wrestler is more nimble than she thought and is able to dodge all of her attacks, while dishing out a bunch of damage to poor Mira. She pushes her to the ground before jumping off the post and slamming Mira really hard. Surprisingly, however, Mira is much more stronger and sturdier than you would expect and simply gets up once again, getting into her stance. They clash once more and this time Mira lands a hit, but the wrestler is able to block her attack with her bare hands and head slams her on the ground. Mira still gets up once again but now she doesn't even have a sword. The wrestler decides to finish the fight and goes in for another takedown, but this time Mira dodges before landing a swift slash with her bare hands, which surprisingly enough does more damage to the wrestler than the sword did, and the wrestler starts bleeding. Mira decides to follow through and delivers a double slash with her bare hands which again does a lot of damage to the wrestler, who starts bleeding and falls to the ground. Jin who was watching this fight, cheers for her, but before he could go to meet her pack, alongside a green-haired commissioner, walks in the room. Pack tells him that his punishment has been decided and that he will have to fight against this broccoli of a man. Like everyone else, Jin hates broccoli, so he tells Pack that he wants to fight the blondie instead and starts throwing a tantrum on the floor. Broccoli gets pissed off and tells Jin that he is stronger than blondie. On hearing this, Jin gets up again and tells him that before they fight, he will have to lose his glasses as he doesn't want to break them. This enrages Broccoli who punches Jin across the room but Jin is a simple-minded fool who runs back to him and tells him to punch him once again. Pak, however, stops them and tells them that they will fight tomorrow inside the ring. Later that evening, he meets up with Han and Mira, while going back to his house and offers them the fruits that Pak gave him so he can replenish his energy. Both Han and Mira refuse his offer, as he tells them the punishment that has been decided for him. Mira comments that the commissioners are really strong, but Jin confidently tells her that he is going to win the bout tomorrow. He arrives back at his place that night and starts eating the remainder of the fruits before spreading out his bedsheets to get some rest, but suddenly he feels sick and starts puking blood, realizing all too late that the fruits have been poisoned. 
The next day, Jin is nowhere to be seen in the arena, but the first match of today is between Han and the Nerd. They both step inside the ring, standing on each side, while the Nerd starts reading details about Han, like what his fighting style is, what his special moves are, and how he fights in general. He claims that he studies his opponents and their art very deeply and gains a complete understanding of how they fight, so that he can figure out proper defenses and counters against them. Han seems taken aback by the level of detail he knew about him, but he decides to focus on the match. The match starts and Han immediately rushes towards the nerd, trying to punch him. But the nerd swiftly dodges out of the way before delivering a bunch of hits on Han's body, making him kneel down. Han realizes that the nerd is basically predicting what his next move is going to be, which is very annoying and problematic for him. Han, however, is not stupid, and has been reading and understanding the nerd's style of fighting as well. They both clash once again, but this time Han dodges all of the attacks that the nerd tried before trying to land a kick, which is blocked by the nerd immediately. The nerd is very surprised and asks whether it was just dumb luck that he dodged all of the attacks, but Han replies that he had memorized his attack patterns, which made it easy for him to avoid the hits. The nerd rushes at him once again, but ends up slipping and falling on the ground while Han was coming at him. Instinctively, he ends up hitting Han on the head with his bat, but realizes later that Han was trying to help him get up. He asks him why he did not attack him, but Han replies that attacking an opponent who is on the ground is not his style, while he starts bleeding from his head. The nerd smiles at this act of genuine kindness before getting back up again for another round. They run each other again and this time he uses his bat to hit Han multiple times at once all over his body, which hurts Han, who staggers over to the ring, bleeding. The nerd decides to take advantage of this and uses his special attack, which manifests a bunch of spikes in the air and shoots it at Han, but Han is ready to get serious finally and uses his special magical punch to destroy the nerd's bat before using another attack which calls a tornado inside the ring and as soon as it fades they engage in a brutal fistfight but Han is able to get an upper hand and starts beating him to a pulp before pushing him against the ring to go for one final attack but stops himself as he realizes that the nerd has already lost and falls down on the ground Han is declared the winner and they both leave the ring for the next match which is between Jin and Broccoli Broccoli enters the ring, but there is still no sign of Jin anywhere. Mira starts wondering whether anything happened, because Jin wouldn't miss this fight for the world. Just when the commentator was about to declare Broccoli as the winner because of Jin not showing up, but just at the last moment, Jin enters the stadium, running up to the ring, and jumps in. The commentator immediately starts explaining the rule, telling Jin that this will be a handicap match, as Broccoli is much stronger than him. Jin only has to knock Broccoli to the ground once, and he will be declared the winner. Broccoli seems to be very confident as the match starts, but is instantly surprised when he notices that Jin is already right in front of him. Jin calmly takes off his glasses, telling him that they can break before pushing him to the ground in a very smooth movement. The commentator is shocked and stutters out that Jun Mori has won the match. Broccoli, however, recovers from his shock and gets angered by the disrespect before trying to punch Jin, but he simply dodges and kicks Broccoli against one of the posts. Broccoli loses his cool and releases his true powers in the form of a giant joker with a giant scythe. Jin starts running away as the joker slices at him again and again, while all he can do is duck and jump, while crying for help as he doesn't know how to fight against this thing. He tries to run up the scythe of the joker, to reduce the distance between them, but he is captured by the joker, who starts to crush him in its hands. Just before the joker can deliver the final blow however, it disappears in thin air, leaving Jin confused. He looks over to see Broccoli being held by the rest of the commissioners, while Pac walks past him, telling Broccoli that three months of his pay has been cut for this act. He walks up to a totally exhausted Jin, congratulates him for defeating Broccoli, and tells him that he has been reinstated as the competitor in this tournament. They all start heading back to their houses as the livestream declares that there are only four players remaining in the tournament now, as we are already in the semifinal rounds. Mira is matched up against Han, and Jin is matched up against some random guy that no one knows. On their way back, however, a blue-haired guy in a very expensive car rolls up to them and immediately gets out of it, drops on one knee and proposes to Mira to marry him, shocking both Han and Jin. It turns out that this guy is supposed to be a very rich and famous influencer who is an excellent martial artist and more or less the face of martial arts in their country. One day, he dropped by her dojo after scanning her from afar and straight up asked her to marry him. She would have said no, but her main goal is to fulfill the last wish of her father, which was to make sure that the moon sword style survives the test of time, and that she passes it on to the next generation of students. Sadly, however, the moon sword style is a very obscure art, and not many people learn it, or know about it. 
So when this rich boy told her that he would help her spread the reach of Moon's sword style through his influence, she agreed to marry him, even though she doesn't like him at all. Jin is totally against this, as this marriage would mean that she would have to pull out of the tournament, which she doesn't want to happen. He even arrives at her dojo to try and make her change her mind, but she tells him that this doesn't concern him at all, and he should mind his own business before shutting the door in his face. He quickly runs out and reaches a telephone booth where he calls Han up and tells him everything he learned. Han, who has been working multiple jobs and extra shifts to earn more money and help with his best friend's treatment for cancer, doesn't have enough time to listen to Jin meddling in others' lives. He tells him that they are outsiders and shouldn't try to insert themselves into situations that don't concern them before hanging up the phone. The next day, Jin arrives at the wedding without any invitation and sits by a girl who turns out to be Mira's sister, who just realized that Mira doesn't like the person she's going to marry and starts crying. Jin tells her that he is here to help and that he is her friend before trying to get inside the ceremony. He, however, is stopped by a bunch of security guards who tell him that no one without an invitation is allowed and that he should leave the place immediately. Jin backs off, faking that he is going to leave, but turns around and tries to run through them, but fails miserably. The guards take out their batons and start attacking Jin, who keeps dodging their attacks until one attack that was going to hit him is stopped by the coolest guy alive, Han. He blocks the attack before punching the guards straight in the face, knocking them all out. This dude is the real One Punch Man. They walk inside of the room, interrupting the ceremony. The rich guy looks at them and tells them to leave before he calls security, but then realizes that the entire security has been dispatched by the two of them. He tells them to leave if they know what's better for them, but Jin tells him that they are not going to let him marry Mira and take away all her hopes and dreams by pinning her faith on a sleazy rich guy who is never actually going to do anything for the sword style. The rich guy gets mad and takes out his sword before running up to them and attacking them. Han, however, simply grabs the sword and tells Jin to go to Mira. Jin runs over to Mira, who tells him to go away, but he starts asking her whether she doesn't trust her father and what he taught, and if she does, and why is she pinning all her hopes and dreams on a sleazeball that she doesn't love at all. Mira gets mad and starts punching him, while Jin simply defends against her flurry of attacks, till Mira's uncle, the only father figure that Mira has, runs in between her punch and tells her that Jin is telling the truth and that she should listen to him. Mira has a realization in which she realizes that when her father said he needed an heir to inherit the moon sword style, he meant her, and not her uncle. This makes her decide that she's going to make sure the sword style survives on her own, and she walks up to the rich guy, telling him that she isn't going to marry him. The sleazeball seems to have lost his mind or something because he starts laughing like a maniac in a cheap film, before he unleashes his true power, which manifests itself in the form of an ethereal samurai, similar to what Broccoli did in his match against Jin. Both Han and Jin are taken aback, but by this sudden newfound confidence, she stands her ground even when he attacks her and slashes her stomach open. She takes the damage like a champ before using her sword style to land a single hit on him, knocking him out. They all go outside and Mira thanks them for saving her from this marriage before apologizing to Jin for behaving coldly towards him. Suddenly, they hear the laughing voice of the sleazeball who stole Mira's sword and ran off with it in his car. Jin tries to chase him, but Mira stops him, telling him that she doesn't need the sword to keep spreading the Moon's sword style in the world, and that she will defeat Han in the semifinals tomorrow, and will win the finals as well. The next day comes and Jin, the absolute idiot, didn't wake up on time. He rushes towards the stadium and arrives just in time to witness the final moments of the match between Mira and Han, which shocks him to the core as he sees a ruthless and cruel one-sided beatdown by Han, hurting Mira relentlessly, injuring her severely, till the point where she was bleeding from all over her body. She drops to the ground, but Han still seems to be going for another attack, when the referee stops him, claiming that he has already won the match. Jin is shaken after seeing the calm and collected Han behave like that and walks past him to the ring for his semifinal fight. Jin goes inside of the next match and is faced off against a random guy, who claims that he has suited Jin's fighting style and can defeat him now. Jin, however, is in the mood for business and the fight begins. The random dude attacks Jin, but he simply dodges his attacks before performing a single attack on him, which takes him down, declaring Jin the winner. He goes back to the ward where Mira is being treated and talks to her. She tries to cheer him up, but he is sad and destroyed by Han's behavior as he seriously thought that they were friends. Mira tells him that there is nothing to be sad about, she was just weaker than him so she lost, and there is nothing anyone could have done there. Jin, however, has made up his mind that he will take revenge on Han and win the tournament for Mira. The next day, they both enter the ring and the referee starts the fight. Jin and Han immediately run up to each other and start sizing each other up, but rather than dodging each other's attacks, 
They are just taking each other's hit and then trying to hit back. Both of them seem to be on exactly the same footing as Han's amazing punching style clashes against Jin's kicking style. They are fighting incredibly well with both landing some pretty hefty blows on one another and once they both end up grazing each other on the chin with some pretty massive attacks, which could have decided the outcome of this battle. Finally, Han gets an upper hand and punches Jin in the guts and then in the face, pushing him back and making him bleed. Jin wipes the blood off of his face and tells Han that he is going to pay for what he did to Mira, before running up to Han who prepares for his special punch, but Jin dodges the attack and instead uses the technique that was strong enough to take down Harambi in one blow. He then lands a massive kick in Han's guts, which sends him flying against the corner post where he falls down. Jin walks up and lends out a hand and Han grabs it and apologizes to Jin, while saying that he never really considered anyone as a friend and kicks him in the face before deciding to use his incredible special punching technique which has four forms. He uses the first form to hit him in the stomach, before using the second form to blow him away with a tornado, and then the third form in which he hits Jin with a barrage of punches that push him to the absolute edge. Jin however is somehow still able to bounce back and runs towards Han to land a disastrous kick, while Han himself charges the final form and they both land their hits on the same time, but Han's attack reaches him first and Jin is knocked down, bleeding from all over his body. Han himself is on the verge of falling over with exhaustion, but he keeps himself on his toes while the referee starts the countdown for Jin. Suddenly, however, Pak arrives and calls Han over to his side and tells him that they weren't able to save his friend and that he just died. It hits Han like a truck and he feels like his entire body lost all of his strength. It turns out that Han begged Pak to save his friend as he can't wait for the tournament to end to get his wish granted, and Pak's medical technology can actually save his life or he will die very soon. Pak made a contract with him, saying that he will put his friend in their life support, but he will have to win both the semi and the finals in a dominating fashion. That was the reason why he was so relentlessly aggressive and ruthless towards Mira as well, but now that he lost his friend he has no motivation to fight, he drops down on his back, whereas Jin gets up once again on his feet, defying everyone's expectations of him being out of the match. Han stands up again as well and Jin starts attacking him, but this time Han doesn't even try to attack him, but keeps defending himself half-heartedly, while Jin goes on the offensive. He gets punched in the guts by Jin and was about to receive a staggering head kick, when suddenly they hear the voice of Mira, telling him to hold himself together. Jin stops in the middle of the attack and Han snaps back to reality. She tells him that he was 200 times stronger when he fought her, so why is he going so easy on Jin and calls him to her side. The referee tells her that she can't stop the match but Jin makes sure that he can't interrupt them. She shows him a letter which his friend gave her, which stated that he knows that he is going to die soon, and that he is happy to have a friend like Han who is fighting for him, but now he wants him to fight for himself. Han smiles at her and tells her to keep it safe for him while he finishes the match. This time, both Jin and Han clash once again, but as friends and not as enemies. They both engage in a long back and forth, at the end of which Han uses his strongest technique once again and blows Jin away. Jin, however, has newfound strength and uses it to muster one last attack, which is his strongest kick. He aims at Han, and when the smoke clears up, he sees that Han is down on the ground and Jin is declared the winner of the tournament. Jin holds out his hand and finally Han starts seeing them as friends and takes their help to walk off the ring. The positions of the first and the second rankers in the preliminary has been taken by Jin and Han, but the third spot is still empty, for which Mira and the random guy who Jin beat up are going to compete. The match begins with Mira and the random dude clashing in the middle, where Mira tries to hit him while the rondo just tries to hold his ground. He starts getting cocky however, thinking the girl can never defeat him and starts showing off his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu moves, when Mira decides to end this farce and hits him straight in the face with her sword, ending the fight immediately. Jin cheers from the sidelines while Han is so embarrassed that he pretends he doesn't know Jin. After the fight is over, they all start going home and discussing their upcoming fights, which will be three-on-three -three team fights rather than one-on-ones. These fights will truly test the level of trust between teammates and how much they are willing to sacrifice to make sure their team wins. Jin is super excited, whereas Mira is dreading to fight alongside a brainless monkey like him. As with him, strategy will be thrown out the window, as he mostly fights on pure instincts and raw skills. While talking and crossing the road, Mira asks Jin what his motivation is. Her motivation is to make sure that Moon's sword style survives, whereas Han wants to fight for his friend. What is he fighting for? Jin looks at them and tells her that he doesn't really have any motivation like that. He just wants to fight strong opponents, get stronger, and be super cool. Han and Mira again move ahead, 
leaving him behind as they don't want to associate themselves with the embarrassment Jin might bring on the road. While he tries to catch up to them, he crosses an old man and feels an odd feeling of power coming from him. He immediately turns around but finds no one there, which surprises him. Later the next day, he goes to a public park and decides to train on his own, but in classic Jin Mori fashion, he gets distracted by any moving thing in his surroundings. He starts chasing a cat, then he starts doing yoga before volunteering to pick up trash, and finally he climbs up on a tree to get a balloon back for a bunch of children. The branch ends up breaking, but he is able to land on his feet. Still, he feels like there is a little bit of a sprain in his ankle, when suddenly, the same old guy that he saw while crossing the road suddenly appears behind him like a Pokemon and uses an acupuncture needle to poke his ankle. Jin gets shocked at first, but realizes that he doesn't feel the pain anymore. Jin asks the old man who he is, but the old guy gives him a crap answer and disappears as suddenly as he appeared. The next day, Jin is woken up by a knock at his door, and he opens it to find Han and Mira standing at his doorsteps, while Mira gets angry at him for always oversleeping. He asks them, where did they get his location from? To which she replies that they just asked the tournament administration, just as he did when he came to her house when she was getting married. They enter his house and see that he lives alone, and his house looks like that of a hobo, with dirty dishes in the sink and every type of trash lying around. Now that I say it, this is how my house looks as well, but there is always a box of tissues and lotion lying around as well. They see a picture of him with his grandfather on the wall, and he explains that he used to live in the mountains with his grandfather, but he told him that Jin needs to get enrolled in the school and needs to get a formal education, and that's why he shifted over here, but the grandfather left him to go back to the mountain. His grandfather and my dad have a lot in common. He has been living here alone ever since. Mira also finds a photograph of him with a couple and curiously asks whether these are his parents, but Jin tells her that they are not, and he doesn't even know who his parents are or whether they are even alive as his grandfather never broached the subject. He tells her that his grandfather had a couple of university students click some pictures with him, so that if he brings a friend over, they will think that Jin belongs to a normal family and is not a psychopath. They all make their way towards the stadium, and on the way, Han explains that he had a conversation with Pak, where he asked him what those otherworldly powers were that Broccoli and the rich Dune harnessed. According to Pak, the gods have been dead for a long time, but there is something in the world known as a chakra, which helps them harness the power of the gods if they push themselves to the utmost limit. He also warned him that from now on, he should expect every single opponent that he encounters to have these otherworldly powers, and should prepare accordingly to deal with them. This troubles them, and Mira also describes her run-in with a commentator from the matches and explains that he is actually blind and was also a swordsman just like her, but used to follow a different school. She tells them that they met in a grocery store where he was with his family and had a chat with her. She tells them that even he warned them to be very careful, as powerful individuals are operating behind the scenes and can pose a serious risk to the competitors. Finally, they reach the stadium, where they gathered in the locker room to have a preview of the teams. Mira, however, notices that the commentator has been changed and gets worried about him. Turns out that the commentator dude got killed that day when he encountered an assassin in a Playboy costume, who belonged to a very powerful group and might pose a risk to the contenders. Finally, the commentator announces that the first match is going to be between Jin Mori's team and another team, so they start getting ready for this huge upcoming fight, with no idea what's going to happen in the fight or what they might encounter.